Top hey, everybody. Hat. I Sorry. accept it. Sorry. <laughs> That's I, know okay. intro. I know that was the intro. We're going to intro. That's whatever. okay. I'm doing an intro. Hey, everybody. Welcome to 20Q, 20 Questions with Interesting People. I am your host, the very handsome Tim Kirk, and our guest this time is raconteur, bon vivant, and man about town, David Moon. Yay. Hey. Hooray. Hey. We're here. We're going to throw in some applause in the background. Oh, we have music. We have yeah, good, 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 all good, that good, type good, of good, stuff. Good. We're going to have everything. Well, we definitely have music anyway, okay. incidental music. So um, we're starting off, and um, the hardest thing for me to do when I started doing this is always, and it always is, to start off with the first question. So okay. I guess that let's just start with the first question. A okay. bit about your background. Where were you originally from? Where are you originally from? And what was it like? Uh, that's What a great question. Thanks for having me on. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, when people ask me where I'm from, I don't really have a really good answer. Um, my father was a former uh, Air Force pilot, and when I came around, uh, he decided to switch to commercial aviation, presumably much more stable and everything. Um, however, while you, you know, many people, many families in commercial aviation tend to stay in one place and everything, uh, a couple things were happening. One, both my parents grew up in like the same house forever, right? Big family, same house. And they were of a mindset of they wanted to go around the world and see things and so forth. So we did a lot of traveling, especially we were on commercial. Um, he flew for Pan Am, one of, the first, uh, really? one of the first black pilots in Pan Am. And uh, as a result, sorry, at some point, uh, he decided that, you know, we move around from time to time. So I, you know, I did Montessori school through first grade in suburban Maryland, and then we moved to Berlin, Germany, uh, for second through middle of fifth, and then moved to Jackson, Mississippi, because we'd been in Berlin, Germany for so long, my mother was getting kind of homesick, so I felt like we were getting detached from the family, and her family being in Mississippi, we moved to Jackson, Mississippi. Then uh, Pan Am had some issues with... Um, uh, basically closed down their uh, New Orleans uh, hub where he was based out of. So we never actually sold the house in Maryland. So we went back to that house in Maryland mm. and so forth. So like every three or four years, there's been a, sh uh, a, a change or a shift. So I don't, there's no like okay. one house. That's interesting. You know, DG's father was a pilot for Avianca. Okay. So, interesting. And... The guy Jerry uh, Jerry Posnack, who Bruce is having dinner with right now, who's going to be another guest, he is um, he got his pilot's license. He flies all planes, mm -hmm. so we have a lot of aviation, which yeah. is a surprising threat. Here's here, here's one you didn't ask. Uh, my, my, one of my claims to fame is that I flew a plane by myself before I drove a car by myself. Really? Yeah, I was about fifteen and uh, fifteen and like three quarters, or whatever, and they uh, went to a summer flight camp. Where they teach you how to fly, get you up through like a solo and everything. Where was that? That was in Alabama, right near Tuskegee. Wow. It was right the transition of where I w we were living in Mississippi and moving up to Maryland. So you took that summer and you learned how to fly a plane. Yeah. And can you still fly? Do you still have the skills? Absolutely not. I mean, I understand the principle of flying a plane, but I'm in no way current or anything like that. Flying a, flying a plane, uh, especially when you're 15, 16, everything's kind of expensive. You know, you, it costs a fair amount of money. And uh, well, my parents are great parents. They were not loose with the purse strings shall we say I so it was not something that i would really could do i had a friend a good friend who went who pursued that he uh went got, did a lot of flying in high school and he just but he had to work his ass off in order to get money to get hours fuel equipment all that kind of stuff so you have to pay for your own fuel as when you do well when you rent the, when you rent the plane or you know lessons Instructor time. That's part of it. That's all yeah, part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting to know. Uh, it, it kind of makes sense. When I went to cooking school, uh, part of the tuition was that you were actually paying for the food that you were cooking. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, know, you, you know, people are. Everyone isn't going to eat all this stuff, and even if they do, you're a student, so you're paying for all this. Right. Wow. Okay. So yeah, um, that was the thing. I got a. I got. I got less. I got more than fifty percent off too because uh, I, I I enrolled well well in advance and I had a few people on my side so it was okay. it was a lot less. Did you, get, did you get to take it home and everything or a lot of the times a lot of the times the pastry stuff I would take home yeah because you know, it was easier to package and I would give it out or it um, wound up uh, uh, in one place I worked at the Village Atelier I was working in the front of the house and I would bring a lot of the stuff that I'd made and we would sell that for for dinner 
And then the owner, of course, was thrilled to death. He didn't have to pay a penny for it. And it was something that was already approved by a chef where we already knew what he was doing. So it was, it had to be servable, you know, so right. everything was good. Nice. So, uh, yeah, so that was, I was doing pastry at school and bringing it to work, uh, to work. And it, it was kind of a benefit, little benefit, little bump at the time. Okay. But that, that was one of the things that I, the, that I did. And it was part and part of just like what you did, you know, you, you were paying for everything you used. Yeah. Because the byproduct was actually something you could eat. Um, so, so that's kind of ten comes right into the next question. Uh, mm -hmm. What life experience had the greatest impact on you? Um, there's one little like uh, story I like to tell. I don't know if you remember uh, comic strip uh, Bloom County. Yes, I do. Okay, so this is right when we're moving from Mississippi to Maryland, and I hate this idea, by the way. First, I never actually know that more moves are coming. I always think, okay, finally we're here. So I've always had that sort of get comfy, get comfy, uproot type thing uh, going on. And because, like, my parents knew that I really did not like this idea, they tried to sweeten the, the deal by getting me in, like, a nice gift for my, uh, for, my, for my birthday, which happens also during that summer. And um, the upshot is... I'm at this new school in the fall. Um, I have this gift. Didn't work out. It was a remote controlled plane. It didn't it didn't like work, work right, so they returned it. So basically, I had like a credit with my parents, if you will, for this amount. I see this kid wearing a shirt with uh, Opus the Penguin on it. I don't know what Opus the Penguin because Bloom County was not existing in, in Jackson, Mississippi. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I, I was, a little too controversial, I, I think, for them at, at, at the time. This is just, just when it's starting to ramp up. Build a cat and all that stuff? Just really? when it's starting to ramp up. It'll get there, but it wasn't there yet. So I just see this guy wearing a, a shirt with a with a penguin. I think he's wearing an office shirt or something, like a little protector and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Or a scarf, I think he also had a little necktie. Yeah, necktie. That's exactly right. And I started talking to him about it. And that started one of the great friendships that I've had that I still have to this day uh, with a buddy of mine named Mike and he's out in uh, Seattle way and we still keep in touch and everything like that but because I started talking to him his father runs like a small computer shop on the side and in fact Mike runs a bulletin board system still no at, at, that, at time, that time at yeah. that time this is way way back. yeah so when I'm trying to think what to do with my little birthday credit um, I'm torn between two products. One is a mocking board, which is a speech synthesizer for an Apple II Plus computer that I had. And the other is a Hayes internal smart modem for the computer. I'm like, eh, I don't know. But, you know, War Games had been out, and that was kind of cool and everything. I wasn't really sure. Well, he vehemently encourages me to get the modem. And once I get the modem, I enter into the world of BBSs and meet all kinds of people, functionally go, you know, do like around the world in you, terms of seeing can, things yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And it really just put my love of computers into like turbo mode because now, you know, they can do so much more. You can reach out to all these types of things. And, you know, when you're lonely or whatever, you know, the, the computer's out there and, and other people are out there. And I meet tons of people, people I'm still friends with today, even still, and so forth. And That's fabulous. it teaches you about, you know, back in those days when you're, Things weren't working. You had to study the machine, hardware, software, and all that kind of stuff to get it right. So, yeah, that's that seeing awesome. that one kid uh, wearing a T-shirt pretty much is one of those things that sort of turns your life in a direction. By the way, um, I got a compliment from a random stranger the other day because I was wearing the Doctor Who Dat T-shirt. Nice. And he just stopped. And he goes, "Hey, great T-shirt." I said, "Thank you." He's <laughs> giving me the high sign. So that was pretty cool. And uh, you know, you don't expect that, but. Um, it, it was great because it was actually very congenial. You know, yes. it wasn't, there wasn't, wasn't anything but goodwill. Um, so now here's something. that is a question that I ask everybody, and I get I'm, I get surprising answers on this one. Mm. What would you say to anyone interested in an aspect of your experience? Meaning, if someone wants to explore an idea or a prospective opportunity based on what you can tell them, what would be the main thing to encourage or discourage them? Yeah, I think uh, to take it back to maybe in a lot of ways of technology, uh, if you recall, like one of the things that I did at NBC, especially when we were uh, working together, was um, I, felt, I looked at my role as being a middle person or interpreter between the techie people, 
people who are developers and QA and stuff like that, and people who might not have that strength of a background. And so sort of being able to straddle between those two worlds as uh, is something that I've done since forever. Uh, really, it's something I've been able to, I think, do here and other points in my career, just sort of be able to do that. So when people ask about um, technology or going into that field in a lot of ways, something like, or, or just even the basics, I think I'm pretty good at giving them um, or explaining things to them, you know what I mean? That way they can sort of get the perspective of what they are like looking for, be it a quick solution or what do you think I should do if I should go into 3D computer animation? And I can I, I can sort of pick out a lot of questions that might be relevant to what they should consider and go in that kind of road. Very good. So following up with what is your most noteworthy achievement? My most noteworthy achievement is going, let's see. I'm going to have to, I've thought of a few of those things. and And... In a way, an achievement can be, you know, many different things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can, like, win the heart of the person. You can... Yeah, it's what you decide. Own the space. Yeah, I don't know if I have, like, the an absolute solid thing. Like, there's nothing that I can point to as far as, like, a material thing. But I think in a lot of ways, and... This is something that we can get more into later. Um, like I've got like I've somehow looked into it or whatever, but I've got a lot of good people around me. Like got some really great friends. I have a great girlfriend. Hi, Ashlyn. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Ashlyn. Um, you know, just people just in my life and everything. And it's not like I'm like brutally cultivating or or or, or climbing to try to get these people, but. You know, it's just really great, and yeah, I think that's that's like a thing that 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 I've got that I can say like I truly you know earned, I guess in a way. This one is something because it always ties into the other questions. Uh, as uh, what is the biggest personal challenge you have faced? A personal injury, a seemingly overwhelming task, a personal or professional goal. A difficult situation you had to overcome, something along those lines. What was the biggest challenge you have faced? Uh, when growing, uh, uh, I guess it was sort of like ex accept accepting that the original career path I sort of had in mind for me it wasn't going to work out. And it was sort of like, now what? And it happened for a few reasons. One, um, Similar to uh, my father, I thought I would pursue a career in military aviation, and you know, I had the, I liked the flying part, but I would rather the military pay for it. And as it turns out, during this time, it was during a time of when world peace was breaking out, and they really weren't hiring, if you will. Okay. So despite all my scores and everything, I was looking pretty good for it. Um, if you remember Top Gun. Oh, yes. Um, I wanted the job of Maverick, and they wanted to give me the job of Goose. Okay. And Goose is kind of uh, looking forward. It's kind of like more of a dead end job. Um, it's it's that's just what the situation is. So I was like, and that was actually to propel me for, further because I wanted really to be. I clung to the astronaut dream for quite some time. Did you? Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah, and I had uh, steered my blindly steered my college career toward through aerospace engineering because I was like they're gonna love that you know, aerospace engineer want to be a pilot and everything like that I was exactly wrong about that um, most well a significant number of pilots were like liberal arts majors they just like the GPA to show that you can do the work on the thing that you try to do not necessarily the content of what you're gonna do That's so interesting as well. so yeah so I'm basically three years in on an engineering program that's kind of rough because uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge, and I'm competing against, um, sorry, sociology majors and psychology majors, majors that are generally a little bit e considered to be easier by some, by some imagination or by some people. And um, I'm losing, and I'm not getting you know, the gig 
the thing that I want. And I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, like, what what is this all about? And I've, I've, I, you know, I kept myself very um, clean and proper, if you will, looking forward to the day that, you know, I would go through this sort of uh, gauntlet and everything. And then I was like, wow, this is, this is not going to happen. And sort of retooling my head is like, well, what are you going to do now in this world? And so, you know, I did it. You know, it, it took a long time to, to find new directions, but I managed to pull it off, change the major to astronomy, um, got way more into the computers and tech, which had been more of the hobby, but kept going in that way and so forth. And it was just hitting that wall and being like, now what? That's a good one. That's a really, it's a tough, that's a tough road to hoe. Yeah. Sure, I can understand that. Um, so following up with that, what would you say was the transformational moment in your life? A meaningful gift, a reason to belong to something, being a parent, good job, bad job? Yeah. Something more. What was the moment? What was the thing that transformed Man. you? I think, I mean, how I, how I got to sitting in this room with you is like you just it's amazing little itty bitty things um that just happen in order to make that come to pass i could name a couple of you know, my assignment of dorm floor in college you can directly link to why i'm here because i meet certain people in certain situations and all that kind of stuff um stay not um getting into dramatic conflicts with one person means that that person sees me favorably later and pushes me in a direction and so forth. Um, yeah, stuff like that. That's... Yeah, it's, it's just amazing if you just like map things out as far as like, you know, it, it, it's it, the, the, the bridges, the paths and everything that, that's gotten all of us into where we are is, is pretty, pretty amazing. And, and, very unpredictable. I didn't. I wouldn't think I was going to live here. Um, but to get to the uh, to get to the question or to get to the answer, because uh, I, I kind of scoped this one out in advance. I gotta say, man, that getting that getting getting into, I think, uh, like a middle school, an elementary school gifted and talented program in Mississippi. Really. Um, because it take it took me out of school in terms of being the rigid rote thing, and then they put me into this other world. Like uh, once, once I think it was once every couple of days or something like that, where learning is very different, and what they're teaching you is very different. And it was exciting and everything, and that puts me into the room where you know I see this Apple II computer, okay, Apple II computer, and I'm just like, whoa, you know, I'm blown away. You know, dig into it me and a couple other guys and you know, a couple of the kids at the time of course uh we're all about it we're looking through the schematics we're trying to figure out this, how this magical box works and everything and yeah i mean i you know i could do some people answers but just that that introduction to technology at that young age is really really substantial oh uh, there you making go me where i am putting more where i am and it, no, it's his old boys. <laughs> it was it was heavily it old was boys. Like we were monopolizing that machine. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, but we were like not even like we would come in early from school. We would stay late after school. You know, so just motivated, poking this thing stimulated. with a stick. Yeah. And there was no porn. There was no porn not, in this not era. Yet, not yet. So we were driven by the tech. And I don't. Yeah, boy, I tell you, kids today. Good luck, kids. <laughs> Yeah, everything's at the end of the fingers on the right. phone. You know, it's a different world. It's a different life. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, we were happy just to watch scrambled, you know, channels on the TV. I think that's a boob. Yeah, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, oh, man, man, I go tough. back to the uh, to the stolen Playboys. Now, this is another question. No, it seems kind of stale and kind of trite, but okay. this is something that people uh, I, I need to know about. Everybody is what is it that drives you? What makes you get up in the morning? What's the thing that you look forward to every day, or or, or whatever, whatever you maybe you don't look forward to, but you it makes you get up. Yeah, I just um, like right now, like right, you know, I kind of don't have the like a regular sort of day job right now, but. There's always like things 
anything else like to do. Like there's a task that has to be done. Sometimes you know you go to bed and you have these things in your head like, okay, I gotta do this, this, this. That's usually short term stuff. It's not like write a novel. Yeah. It's you know I gotta go to here, I gotta go to here, stuff like that. And I think just feeling that there's like something needs to get done, and you've got to do it. And okay, three more minutes. Okay, now get up. Now go. You know, do a little snooze time or something like that. But yeah, just that feeling that something. It's got to get done, and you know you're the only you're the only person who can handle your own stuff in your place. You know, if I've got to, when you know when I had to, uh, I don't know, take the cat to the vet. Cat's got to go to the vet. You know, you build your sort of day around these types of things. Um, if there's a opportunity to to <coughs> excuse, do something in bettering, if you will, like. Some gym time, some climbing gym time, or something like that. You know, be excited about that. Like things are going to happen. The, the day is always like full of potential, fun things, or interesting things can happen. So you might as well just get out there and, and get into it. It's interesting. I've heard this. Uh, uh, people say uncertainty, possibility. Yeah. And I said the same thing. Yes, possibility. The idea that there's a there's the possibility is rather than stay still, do nothing. Well, or just stick in a routine. Just a possibility of something different that'll yeah. change, and you can add to it. No matter what it is, even if it's if it's you know microscopic, it, that's the thing that makes me want to get up in the morning. Yeah, you know, I don't, uh, if you don't feel well, that's another thing. Oh, sure enough, feel well, or um, like I have, I have friends who've had depression and everything. They yeah. tell me about mm-hmm. there's days they spend in bed, and mm-hmm. that's just, and it's, to me it's terrible one that they're suffering through this, and also I just don't understand like. And you can't understand it unless you yeah. unless you understand it for yourself. Sure, but I just mean like just being in the like just the prospect of it is like whoa, like what, what stuff's happening, stuff's going on. You could do stuff, and, yeah, you know, stuff like that. I, mean, I, I had the, uh, the thing when you don't have a steady thing to do every day, you kind of lose perspective of how much you actually do when you do have a steady thing to do every day. Yeah. So everything gets blown out of proportion when you have to just go to the dry cleaners or pick up something. Well, that's that's not the focus of your day. That's just a little something mm-hmm. that you did. And um, but but having giving yourself tasks to do, as far as yeah. I'm concerned, it's one of those things that it's it's the motor that keeps you going mm-hmm. and it keeps everything in a regular. It puts everything in perspective because you you don't lose sight of it. it doesn't get blown get blown out of proportion. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it from here, but and this is great for the podcast, but. Uh, over there, see that mirror. Yes. You know, I'm constantly writing things on there to do in a day. I like to like sort of erase it every maybe the day or at least maybe a couple days, and keep writing things on there. So even the smaller things, for one, it's uh, you know you're writing them on there to these are things I need to get done or need to get done, and then also keeping them on there when they're crossed off is sort of a sign at the end of the day of like this is some of the things that you did today. Mm. And I've, I've actually found it pretty, pretty useful as opposed to just sort of like, uh, I don't know, I don't know. And then the things that need to get done aren't getting done. At the end of the day, you, you sort of like, what, what happened today? What, what did I do? Yeah. What, what has happened? So I've used, I've started to use that as a great tool. Otherwise, I would totally get rid of that mirror. I, I think the mirror is cool in the first place. But uh, I, cool. to-do lists, uh, that's something else that's very very consistent with a lot of people, myself included, um, to do, knocking one thing off after another. Yeah. And I usually give myself a to do the day before. I don't, I don't wake up in the morning and say, what do I have to do? Even though maybe lately a little bit more like that, but I'm usually someone go, okay, tomorrow I got to do these 17 things. Mm-hmm. And, and they have to get done. And if I can't do them, okay, but at least I have it on the list to get it and it'll get done. If I don't, if it just like, swirls around, and it, you, you've made a, a more concrete step to get something done. Mm. Just by making a list and giving yourself the responsibility to do it. Yeah, and and we haven't got into it. Uh, maybe we'll get maybe it hinges on another question or whatever. But uh, I have a terrible memory, absolutely terrible, um, ridiculously terrible. In fact, I wonder if there's like a tumor or something in there. But it's been there all my life, so I'm okay. Uh, if I don't write things down like that, then they just get lost, and then maybe they bubble up later. a day later or something like that, and. Um, you know, maybe it's in time to still do something about it, or maybe it's not. But I've I've found that to do listing and these types of things, you know, these are the ways to help augment, you know, an issue that I've got. So, sure. Oh, and, and I and I've thought about other things that have just like um, like how things are so different now. 
How many phone numbers do you know? I no, two or three. Yeah. Mine? Like there was a time yeah, when you knew it? all the phone numbers, you knew all your friends' phone numbers and everything like that. Oh, um, yeah. I drive. I just I, w- I had to pick up my uh, my Jeep from getting worked on out in New Jersey. I didn't look how to get there really. I just didn't look to... how to get back. Yeah, I just took it to the phone. To, like we used to na- you have to know how to navigate. I'm sure it was even more intense in the city. Oh yeah. You know, people used to navigate you know, the subway lines by memory. I still do. And everything. Yeah, it's yeah. probably burned into your brain. It, but, it is. But, but nowadays, you don't know these things. Uh, the thing that I I, I always bring up because most people my age uh, will go, oh, they asked. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Having to wait online to use a public phone mm-hmm. and in the afternoon, not in a nightclub or a bar or a restaurant or something like that. You know, you had to, or you go to a building lobby and there'd be sure. a bank of pay phones and you pull the thing over, just like Superman would change. It was that type of thing. Or you'd wait online and you're like, hey, come on, will you wait? And people would mm-hmm. wave you off or they say something. I'm like, I'm on an important call, you know, that type of thing. And you'd sure. wait. Or you'd be at a bar and you had to meet somebody. Oh yeah, and meetings that was like strategically planned. Like you, you, you you better be there. You better believe it. And you, if you got on the phone with that person, mm. you went to the place and they said, "Call me when you get to that." You know, now I'm around the corner, and you know you you need to be waiting for 15 minutes. You know mm. that type of thing. Pretty pretty common uh, uh, for most people to to remember that. Um, okay, so so the next question is. What is your Zen? Building or constructing, usually like smaller things. Like I love to do, uh, for example, one of my hobbies for a long time was making chain mail. Um, not just like this. I could show you some pieces that I actually have here. They're like full shirts and everything like that. Not not even a part of that. That's, really? No, that's, that's all solid stuff. Uh, I have an armor stand here with armor. Uh, no, I mean, like, I and I didn't do it for the armory type stuff. I did it for, like, fun, for fashion and stuff like that. Uh, I made a, a girlfriend I had once a, a dress, and you could yeah. just sort of get into it and just get into the the, the hobby, not Processing. like the dress. Yeah. But, yeah, you just, like, go into, <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're, well, okay, yes. But, you know, getting into the mechanical <laughs> process of doing a thing and, and, and visioning it in your mind and getting it together, uh, like a lot of the stuff here, um, it's Ikea or Ikea type furniture. I love that, you know, just give me some, give me a, a manual and some, some wrenches and some stuff up and, and, you know, I started modifying things a little bit and making them sort of my own in that way. And uh, I think I showed you before we started, you know, that, that, that land project I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Where you just sort of like imagine in your head what it's going to look like, and you're like, yeah, okay, right. get into it, and that that took a lot. Um, there there was a significant amount of earth to be moved there, and it took a long. It's still really a process, but um, it took many many days of you know some pretty full full days, and you just sort of like get your head into it, and it slowly becomes the thing that you envision, and when it's done, you're like, oh yeah, that so, was great. Garrett's telling me last night that. Uh... He used to love playing with Lego. Oh, and you put things together. Absolutely. And then he'd, he'd find something wrong with it to take it apart and do it again, all over again. Yeah, you totally know, a Lego kid. You know, just that was so that was a Zen for him yeah. as well. So it's very similar. Probably came. In. I don't. I. You know what? And it's weird because Legos came back so strong. Like <clears throat> now it's okay for like adults to be in Legos and everything, but it never really got back to me. Um. No, I have another one of my ten questions. This is I think number nine. What's the first thing you want to come to people's minds when they think of you? Um, I guess I just want to be like thought of as like a, I think I want people to be comfortable. I'm not necessarily a person who likes to like, you know, be the asshole or poke at people or stuff like that. At least I try not to. I don't think I'm doing that. Mm-mm. You know, I want people to be like, oh, Go good, you're here, you know, or something like that. Because like maybe something good will happen, or we'll talk about, it or say funny things, or something like that. You know, just like a general like positive feeling. Very like, good. Like some people are like very bright, if you will, socially. You know what I mean? Like they just walk in the room and they do that walk. I'm not at that level by any means or anything like that. But you know, when people see me, it's like, oh, okay, this is this will be a, you know nicer than it was. 
Very interesting. But a lot of consistency in people's answers. It's really surprising. We all huddled together. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question that I have, which is uh, something that everybody has a different answer. Now, I've already had people giving me answers, written answers to this mm-hmm. before beforehand. And um, it's interesting that people um, have a little wary about answering this, they, or they just don't know. But the question is the threshold. Everyone's crossed a threshold in their life, and it's a place where there's no turning back. And how do you know when you've arrived there? How did it feel to cross it? What was the significance to you, and what did you leave behind? What are you glad you left, and what do you regret leaving behind? Well, after I think I'm going to recycle and maybe get into a bit more detail um, with that sort of transition between David Moon is going to go into the Air Force, he's going to fly planes, he's going to then be an astronaut, and then it really wasn't clear what happened after that. Um, because that was really like a big turn in what I was going to into my outlook. And in fact, it wasn't a turn towards anything. It was just a turn away from the thing to void. Okay. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not doing that. So I'm going to do something else. And because I don't have like that other, or didn't have, and really kind of don't have that other target, I find that I'm pretty free flowing. It's like, I'm still in a way, the person who's not doing that thing. Okay, I understand that. Sure. So now I can do almost anything, or I'm doing almost anything. Uh, my career path since then has been, you know, bounced around. It's, it's you know, I was, I've been a 3D animator. I've been an a engineer on a laser ranging telescope project. Yeah. I've been uh, running a, 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 an answer center for partner not uh, partners at uh, Price Warehouse Coopers um, was when I worked there uh, I did a bunch of different things at NBC mm-hmm. uh, one of the reasons why I liked uh, being there was because you know if you work the same job for a few years or so you get bored but between moving around and reorgs and stuff like that and, and you know just the the way it goes I was doing different stuff all the time um, and I'm kind of open to doing that. And I don't know what I'm going to do next necessarily. But it won't probably won't be something I've done before. Um, because every time you know, I've gone through a, a change like this, you know, I'm just like, all right, well, let's do something else over here. And I, I'm fortunate in which I've, I've been able to, to do that. And I hope to be able to do that in the future. Um, so, but yeah, but, it, but looking back, um, you know, you mentioned that uh, the, prism, the prism of the, the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon album. Mm-hmm. And you sort of see that like bright white light come in. So that was it. Like that was the initial part. And you know, that was heading in that one direction and it was gonna be a thing. And then I hit that point where I was like, it's not gonna be the thing. And it just scatters into all kinds of stuff. Now what questions have you decided to answer? Oh, there we go. Well I got a few, I got a few, I got a few. Uh I'll get some short ones so we can like some of the ores are nice. Um, for example, if we get to, would you say you are more freewheeling or structured? I think I'm pretty freewheeling, to be honest. Um, I don't, I, 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 I adhere well to, to okay to structure. I don't want to say well, but okay enough. But in the general sense, I find myself, you know, on my own, just sort of winging it in a lot of ways. Okay. That's 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 what I'm doing so far, and still seems to be working out. So, um, let's see. Do you want do you want to like do it in any order? Or do you, yeah, anyway, I just yeah. want to make sure we yeah. get to be cover the full twenty. Okay. You know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. The only the name, no one wants to download this, and only have eighteen questions. And be like, I think hey, I, I don't think I got all three or three with that. I was promised twenty questions. Yes. Um, you're particularly fussy about. I would say food. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, very fussy about food. I. In what sense? I guess I kind of like I had a certain. It seems like there was a time when I was a child, when there are a certain amount of foods or certain types of foods I was going to eat, and then that was it. 
there's nothing on the outside of that. Like you know, nothing else is 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 going to happen. And I was even a bit of like a germaphobe or anything like that. I was only child, so there was no direct sharing of food or or drinks or anything like that. Like I remember, it's not um, I think a completely life scale changing of it. But I remember like the first time I drank out of something that someone else drank out of. Really? Yeah. It was that big a deal. Boy Scout camp. We would be on. I was. I was. I was a Boy Scout for two weeks. Uh, cause, you know, I lived in. I was living in Germany at the time, and my uncle in, in the U.S. in Mississippi was a scoutmaster, and his sons were scouts. And for some reason, parents got the idea that you know you should try this scouting thing when they go to summer camp. And we went on this super long hike in Mississippi heat and dust and everything, and like. Uh, we didn't have water with us where we ended up going had water and I barely didn't have any gear anyway. And only a few of us had canteens and we were sharing it. I was like, oh, well, so you had to share yeah, to, drink, just, to survive. Yeah. The drink stuff, so How old were you? About 11, 12? Was, yeah. 11, 12 range, something like that. Wow. That's interesting. Um, but yeah, food types. Yeah, the first time you shared something, you had something. First time I remember. You I'm remember. Sure it yeah, when yeah. I was a little kid or something like that. Uh, okay. but, yeah. But, you know, but generally just food. And after that, I was like, okay, well, you know, didn't really die or whatever. But foods are, yeah, I'm, I've, uh, my, my, my girlfriend, I'm sure, could tell you with great eye-rolling fanfare of all the different things and I've got in terms of food. So, I mean, you already know about the chocolate and candy, right? The pun? Chocolate and candy and yeah. general stuff like that. You know, I don't eat chocolate. My niece doesn't eat like doesn't that. eat chocolate. She's yeah. never liked chocolate her entire life. No, I, was, I don't. That's not necessarily a like thing. It just was raised funny. Okay. My mom, uh, she, she she always meant well, uh, but she tends to like get into follow a, a, a person or a school of thought about a thing for a little while, usually in pop culture. So, for example, uh, growing up, I was, you know, she was like on a super low fat kick. And she gave that up when she was realizing that I was getting up in the middle of the night, you know, three, four, five, something like that, and going to the refrigerator and like eating butter. <laughs> like she sees teeth marks in the butter in okay. the morning and everything. She's like, okay, okay, maybe I'm doing too hard on that. But yeah, never was a fan of candy chocolate stuff like that so that was sort of instilled as like being a bad thing to eat functionally really so yeah so halloween everybody wanted to hang out with me because i was just in it for the costuming okay you know, i would do the ritual of getting the hey, candy you give it out yeah, i don't care I'd really stuff yeah i have my, my my niece i remember her as a, a as a, a baby she had zero interest in anything chocolate mm. And she, you couldn't get her to eat white chocolate it wasn't a thing she just didn't didn't yeah. have any affinity towards this stuff well, every other kid would just gobble up anything around her. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she even, uh, when they'd make a, a birthday cake for her, she'd wait for the candles to burn down. She wasn't interested in eating the cake. Wow. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Just, that's just who she was. It wasn't anything that anybody said to her, or she didn't have any that sort of trauma. So just, mm-hmm. That was just who she was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. You know, that's, just, that, that's an interesting aspect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My mom was so mad at the babysitter once who like, slipped up and gave me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This is amazing. It's too sweet and too sugary. To it get you know, just, up. just wasn't something that I would, it could have been the sugar factor okay. or whatever. But after that, I was like, oh, I love these things. And she was like, all right. So. Okay, so uh, what's the next one? Uh, let's see. What, what did I put down here? I'm just writing these down so we keep track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this, this, this could go in two different directions. 20, uh, 23 is misperceiving. Um, I got two angles on here. I don't know. Um, one's kind of funny. One's kind of super deep. Depending on which one you want to get into. Uh, 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 tell me. I will say that um, growing up in uh, Berlin, I didn't. I again wasn't a part of the military establishment, so I was wasn't going to military schools or American schools. I was going to. Uh, like German American schools, like maybe like where expats would send their kids, plus German uh, uh, families who wanted their kids exposed to American stuff like that. But it was primarily, uh, it was clearly like a German based school in, uh, in terms of curriculum and everything. Um, and I think only really because, like, 
they're so intense as of the learning and everything. When I went to Mississippi, people were like, what is this kid? Um, and one of the first things I remember doing was um, in the transition point, I went to school, uh, again, my uncle's, I think it's uncle's school or something like that. Hello. So that was Dave from my local carpet cleaning company. Oh, excellent. I love when they call about my or from my from my credit card company. Really? That's the best branding you've got? Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here's here's there's two there's two stories that are based on the same same basis of going to school in Germany. You pick the one that you like. Um, so yeah, during the transition of going from uh, Berlin to Mississippi, I was dropped off basically at my uncle's place. And since the school was starting, I was put into school and everything. And, you know, because of the aggressive teaching of the Berlin, uh, of this school, it was, they were just like, wow, you're like crazy smart out and everything like that. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I really wasn't doing that well in the school uh, at the time. But I was just kind of, it was working through some mental stuff. I was kind of sad and everything. But um, I remember convincing a teacher that not only what she was saying was wrong, but the book was wrong because I misunderstood something about fractions. I don't remember what the exact point was, but I completely got her on my side. Really? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to the extent to where... It was super awkward for me when I figured out the right thing, like, ten minutes later. That's a good one. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is not good. So, That's... I actually stayed quiet on that front. Uh, okay. The second one was something else that happens in these schools, uh, I would say Europe especially. Uh, you get that sex ed pounded into you. Pretty young age, like we're really? talking third, fourth grade, um, maybe I think fourth for for where I was, um, and it's pretty explicit, explicit really? as to what's going on. Really, like, the high school stuff I got later wasn't as much as what I was getting in in at fourth grade and everything. And you know, you got sort of like so now, you know, they don't have the same teen pregnancy problem. Everyone kind of knows what's going on what the parts were and what how things work and all that but you no one in fourth grade is running off to the broom closet to really try stuff out no real interest or even figure out girls there's we're still living in the age of cooties so there was always one kid maybe who was ahead of maybe else. And maybe but Someone, then, someone's gonna do some weird stuff yeah, but yeah about one kid. um but <clears throat> they described masturbation and they use like words like you know you're gonna move the penis up and down okay. well, in my mind that way is up and that way is down and i'm pointing up to the sky and down to the ground i don't understand like why would you just like <laughs> flip it up and down pointing it up and then flipping it up and then down and, and so forth like i did not understand that for the longest time that's a lot of work okay so there's a there's a classic like, that's why a cl would that work? why would that work yeah and, and i don't know nobody you'd never share this with anybody and knowing but you know be, having been corrected about stuff you just made an assumption and uh it took forever to if you to to, to realize that or with the the 10 minutes when you got it <laughs> you realize I would correct you. Yeah, but... yeah, that, that's that's, good... that, that's harsh. That's and you're looking back. Oh boy, because <laughs> eventually you know, I was like, she's got. I don't think she figured it out. I think we just it was like a minor point, probably like a couple of, uh, questions or something like that. But still, um, another one. Thirty three. Is there anything you cannot live without? And I, I wanted to hit that because it's part of my personality to try to avoid things that I can't do without or live without. Um, how, is, how so? Uh, when I grew up, both my parents smoked. Okay. Uh, my father smoked big old cigars. My mother smoked uh, Merit 100s, I think, and then switched to something else. I can't remember. And I absolutely hated that. Okay. Um, 
don't know if it was true or not, but I felt like I was kind of like smell sensitive. Like I just knew and it, it just would hit me really hard and everything like that. And I was very anti their smoking and all that kind of stuff. Took every opportunity to rally against it, to be the obnoxious kid saying stuff, to like, why do you have to do that now? We're in the car, all that kind of stuff like that. Uh, and they just, they just seemed like they had to. And I was like, I am not going to do that. And in the same regard, my father was a pilot. Um, he, he liked to drink. And I mean, in a, I would say, professionally responsible way. There was never any issue of him drinking outside of the uh, time span or inside the time span, which you can or not allowed to drink being a pilot, but he apps, but with, within the times that he could, like he absolutely had to have wine at dinner. Okay. If he didn't, going out to the store to get wine and bringing it back, stuff like that. And I just looked at that, like, why, why would you do that? Like, why would you do that? Same thing with my mother and coffee. You know, mother has to have coffee in the morning and all that kind of stuff. Like, why? Well, it just has what I need. Like, well, I'm up. I don't need stuff and you know to get going and all that kind of stuff. So, in a way, it just like I hated the idea of having like these things that you need that a person needs. A crutch, maybe. Yeah, a cr- it just seemed like I you're signing up for hard. a crutch. Yeah, you know. I don't consider that <clears throat> these things crutches. I think they're at this point. A lot of these are just. Uh, Supplements. To, Supplements to are, yeah, like. it's fine. It's just that, like, have coffee. But if you don't have coffee, be okay. Yeah, that's... You know what I mean? It's not tragic. You can't... You yeah, know. or something like that. Uh, and I, don't, and I get it. You know, there's a lot of like, humor around it and stuff like that. And it, it's nothing that I necessarily um, obsess over, like, a day-to-day. But it's just, for the most part, like, I try to avoid having those type of things like in my life so you, you cannot live without denying these things in a way sure sure okay that's right very interesting. that's why i don't do a lot of cocaine you know same yeah. reason you know yeah. actually i don't do any cocaine so no, you but it's that type of thing like years. those things that are like super scary to me it's why i don't do heroin it's why i don't do xyz any kind of weird i don't know any sorts of things where like you see people who really get like locked on and make them a part of their lives. I don't do Magic the Gathering because I saw like that's not a great game or World of Warcraft. It's like people really get into these types of things. And I'm like, yeah, if, if, the, if people get super into something, I get suspicious about it. It's like, what? Okay. Did you tell me you couldn't eat? One of the things you should shun, shun was uh, he can never inject himself with a really type of intravenous drug. Mm. Like just couldn't do it. I couldn't couldn't bring yourself to do that. I was like, okay, that's that's a something you should. You know? Yeah. So what's the next one? That'll be fifteen. Oh, let's see here. Um, let's see. Oh, let's see. Twenty seven. What is your quest? Yes. Um, I have a short motto. Live forever or die on Mars. Okay. That's it. You want to? Either... That's the goal. Okay. That's the goal. That's a good question. That's, that's a good answer. That's where I'm going. That's been my little my little mantra. You ain't for coming a back. Um, probably not. It's all right. Got to die somewhere or something. Might as well make it interesting. It's true. Uh, fulfills my little my still residual astronaut fantasy and whatnot. And um, while you know, absolute living forever sounds terrible. You know, dying tomorrow. Sounds kind of sucky too. So yeah. I'd rather like be more, much more in control of that when things go. So we'll see. We'll okay. see technologies kick along a little faster. I was kind of hoping, you know, when I see a lot of obituaries, I think uh, Margot Kidder recently passed, Tom Wolf. I was hoping like some of the richer people would be like living eerily longer by now, but we'll have to see. Um, so we got five more. Oh, okay. Um, how do I? How do you connect with others in a strange environment? And how do you? It generally depends on the environment, but you know, like throughout my entire like growing up and everything, I've been kind of the odd cat out, you know. In Potomac, Maryland, you know, I was definitely the black kid. Take me to Germany, and now I'm the American black kid. You know, I'm easy to find in all the school photos. Um, put me in Mississippi, now I'm the black kid who has the like the not Mississippian, actually black Mississippian accent. I came from this weird exotic place and things are strange. 
moved me up to Maryland again for high school. Now I'm the kid who's like, it being um, minority wasn't really as much of a thing, and, and and traveling is as much, especially where we were, because there was a lot of international uh, students and everything around that area at that time. By the time we get to that level, but I'm still not them in terms of like uh, uh, culture. I would say there was a rumor that I think. Um, I think it was Aaron Spelling, kind of based, I think it was Belling, uh, Beverly Hills 90210, off of my school. Really? Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a public school, but it's in a wealthy uh, county in Maryland. And, but just that whole, like, culture, like, you know, you turn 16, well, here's your car, um, that type of thing. There's a lot of money flying around at that time and everything, and Again, since my <clears throat> parents were really weren't into the, you know, dropping a lot of money on the kid type thing. Not that I ate every day, I assure you. Um, but I saw the picture of the house. It's <clears throat> very traditional, upper middle class, upper middle class home. Right, right. And um, so I never, like, I, everywhere I've gone, I don't blend fit in. So what I try to do is sort of make my fit and... I'm generally pretty good at maybe like the humor side of things. Like I can try to read rooms and drop in the right amount of humor. However, at the same time, I'm also really good at um, basically having grown up being an only child, you know, I can s sit in the corner and everything. So I don't feel like a lot of high stakes. Like if I don't fit in, it's going to suck. Um, and the thing is going to be awful. It's like, okay, well, I can, I can go in a little bit and maybe a little bit and so forth. And I guess not being, not feeling like that flop sweat, not that desperation of having to get in has been something that I've been able to, to, to do such that I can kind of blend into a lot of different social groups and circles and, and still, I don't know, hopefully be seen as like an additive or a, a positive uh, element to the same. Very good. Bruce, Bruce being an only child, uh, he's, he'd also do that thing. Where he can just be flying in the corner. Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, you mentioned uh, earlier Garrett and Legos. I have thousands of hours sitting in a corner with like Legos in my own head, space, doing my own thing. It's like, okay, well, you know what? I can do that uh, in general. Now, you know, that's also been an anchor in a lot of ways, too, because it's easy for me to just ignore, like, the stuff going around, just get into my own world, my own head, and be completely fine with it. And then it is, it can be kind of off-putting to people who are like, hey, you know, be a part of this, participate in this, and so forth. Yeah, so, that's... Uh, like uh, not fully, like wading into the pool, but not swimming. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're there, but you're not running around and splashing and swimming with the other kids quite as much as you are, you know, sort of like, just being off on your side. So uh, now we're at question 17. 17. I'm going to do uh, ever fake anything and either get away with it or just get caught, caught out and utterly destroyed. Yes. Uh, totally got away with it. I'm sitting here now in many ways because I got away with it. Um, this is just when I'm at that sort of transition point of school and things are not working out during the path I intended. And in the meantime, I'm like, well, I like being a 3D artist. Um, and that was a very fledgling type thing coming out. So I was like, I'm going to work on this for a while. And I was very fortunate. Um, my mom worked for a guy who ran a uh, computer company that basically did a lot of government contract work and everything. And he also had aspirations. He was from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And he had aspirations, political aspirations, like to be involved in the process and everything. So he ran a, uh, a talk show, <clears throat> a public access talk show, okay. and he would bring in people and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, this sounds great. I want to be involved. And so I got involved and he put me on like a small payroll enough to keep me like in rent and fed and everything. And I was like the showrunner for, oh. for his little talk show. But it wasn't really enough to keep going and it wasn't making any money on his side. So he's just paying out of the pocket mostly as a, I'm helpful and a courtesy and everything like that. So one day they get a call from one of their clients, um, Allied Signal, and they're looking for someone who can do a lot of documentation work 
Uh, particularly familiar with the Corel line of projects. Oh, yes. Products, you remember those? Yes. Um, and that's all on PC and everything. Corel well, Draw. Corel Draw, absolutely. Um, and I am I am a uh, Mac and I'm not a Macintosh guy. Not even a Macintosh guy. I'm an Amiga guy. I'm oh, a Commodore Amiga wow. driver. Okay. I'm working the video toaster. I'm working a Lightwave. That's I'm doing all this stuff. Uh, oh my goodness. I'm watching Kiki Stockheimer do cartwheels, all that kind of things, and the transitions and the wipes, and He's like, hey, I think you could probably get this. Like, okay. It's like, what do you have? What what products do they want me to know? And they, you know, it's the Corel suite of products and everything like that. And so, like, I really don't know any of these things. I don't really know PCs because uh, PCs were, in my, by comparison at the time, to me, slow and clunky, and um, graphics were crappy and everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I go and I look in the lobby of this place. And there's a phone interview coming up in like 15 minutes or something like that. So I look in the lobby of, of where we're working, where they park the clients, and I get an ad. I see I see a, like a full page ad for the Corel suite and primarily Corel Draw and everything. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I get on the phone. Uh, we have the interview, and we talk about the general things. We get into the specifics, and he starts talking about wanting to know. And I start asking him questions based on what I'm the bullet point things like that I'm reading in the ad, like. Do you have this module and such and such and all that kind of stuff? And they're like, oh, no, not really. Uh, we're just kind of a basic. And I just keep asking questions based on whatever I can pick up off the ad that seems like something to Boy, be worthwhile Boy, this kid's dynamite. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah, they're like, okay. Um, yeah, it seems like you're pretty good for the task. So we will start you off on, like, Monday. And it's, like, uh, I think it's, like, like Thursday or, or something like that. And I say, okay, cool, great. I'll be there Monday. And left there, went to the nearest bookstore, got all the four dummies books for this thing, and just spent the weekend pretend um, using these products because I never used Corel Draw. Word. I mean, these are also um, um, I, I can't remember their whole suite, but they're like their, their version of PowerPoint, their version of Word, all these things which I never touched before. So I was just like, okay, I guess this is what it's going to look like. And it came in, um, and the deal was they were going to try me out for, I think it was like three months or something like that, as a as a contractor. And through step, 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 I became a full-time employee. They offered me um, a job as a junior engineer on this team, and I stayed with them for like close to like six years. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's great. Yeah. So now question 18. Uh, I'm going to do a short one, um, just because I think it's important, uh, go for happiness. Okay. Um, I think what I've seen people I know and people you just see have to do in order to go for money often kind of blocks the happiness. I think a lot of times people forget that maybe... The money is for happiness. I actually don't really subscribe to that. I've sort of a, you know, money doesn't make you happy. Money insulates you from the things that make you unhappy. I want to take it to, to, to extremes. Like being hungry will make you unhappy. Yeah. Money can fix that to, you know, to an extent. Like being cold outside is something to make you unhappy. Being able to afford clothes or at another level, it's a level being of able to be in a place. Right, right. You can avoid, you can you can throw money at things to avoid the suffering. You maybe can't always count on money taking you above satisfaction to to joys, to happiness, and things like that. You know? Yeah. That's where that's where I, where I'm coming from from that angle. It's like you can you can get the money. But it doesn't guarantee that now you will be happy. Yeah, it does not. It certainly does not. Especially what you do with it. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I would love to have money so that I could have, be free from the worry of needing money. Right. But trying to find something really constructive to do with a real good chunk of that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So that I always have money to do something that would be a, a benefit. Mm -hmm. Rather than I mean, some sort of beneficial contribution, rather than just indulging myself, because I, I keep on thinking, like, even if you know you win the lottery, you do something like that, 
what's the goal? Is is the goal just to like be King Midas sitting in a, in, in a yeah. throne and being so uh, distant? And you've lost connection with reality. Right. That, who wants to be like that? I mean, I, I wouldn't mind having the experiences and the thrills and doing all those other things. But at the same time, I like keeping my feet on the ground. Sure. You know, so I, I, I don't think the idea is, uh, is is such a so appealing that I want to put myself off in an ivory tower. No, that's that, that that I would never want to do. Uh, I, I would like to not have to worry and not have the, the burden of right those those uh, worries struggle, like removing those worries yeah. and then like the struggle. That's the purpose of money. And then I but, also think I'd feel guilty uh, mm-hmm. with other people struggling around me. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. But it, what you want is you want the happiness. I, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, um, in terms of what I'm doing with this, this, yeah. this is immensely enjoyable. I mean, exactly. this is, I, I, I you, you can't pay, you know, I, I pay for pieces of bits and pieces, and yeah. most of this came from Bruce. But I mean, that's not the point. It's, 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 it's not to have this go, oh, look at me, I've got this, and I'm, you know, flagrantly uh, conspicuous consumption. That's that's not that's not me, you know. Uh, that's not it's, that's definitely not me. Even though I do have, you know, the, the little earmarks that everybody does. That just you know, like I have a, you know, I don't wear a ring or something like that. You know, but that's it's not the point. Mm-hmm. Hardly the point to me. Um, I think you can reward yourself with little little things here and there, but uh, that's not. I I don't live for that, and I don't I don't think anybody should. But you know, it's not for me to say. Other people, I don't know what their what that could be theirs then. Yeah, you know, it's true. I don't know. No, but but I mean, it, that, if that's the only thing is the shallow superficiality of it, that's not. You know, and and, I, and I'm not still I'm, I'm talking like a nineteen year old, but I, I still I still feel that way. Mm-hmm. So okay, so now we go to question eighteen. Uh, oh, I that was eighteen. Uh, let's see, what is it? I think um, one that sort of stuck out as interesting because it was different from all the others is the relationship with the animal kingdom was okay. my relationship with the animal kingdom um, and I think it could be complicated in a way because I am a carnivore um, I do eat animals and so forth but at the same time I do have a, a pretty good respect for living creatures on the whole living entities, not just animals, but also plants as well. Um, you know, regardless of <coughs> how, even at the consumption level, you know, in order for me to live, something is, or many things are going to have to die. Uh, for me to exist in this world, mm-hmm. I'm going to step on a worm, I'm going to do other things, or I'm going to try to be... Um, like those monks that cover themselves with screens so that they don't maybe inhale a bug or something like that. It's very difficult to do that. Even then, you'll still have a problem. So uh, I try to sort of like tear my animal respect, if you will, um, putting, let's say, your humans, other primates, and your dolphins and your elephants, animals that have clearly expressed or shown to be, you know, expressively intelligent at the, like the do not mess with zone, if you will, um, and try to preserve and so forth. Then you get to your foodie animals where I would like them to be um, at least given their destiny to be treated as humanely as possible and to be utilized as much as possible and so forth. And in this space, you know, you also... In terms of like size, mass, whatever, you've got your your pet zone, and I have great respect for pets, people with pets, and so forth. I've had now two cats, uh, previously a dog, a hamster, stuff like that, but never really, not only have like a house packed full of animals, but still, you know, through their time, um, have enjoyed them and so forth. And then, you know, you get down to maybe your, your, your smaller and even down to bugs like I try not to do a lot of bug killing I'm the guy who's gonna try to capture it and take it outside and so forth um, I do try to swat them away rather than kill them even yeah. though I have had plenty of kills um, yeah I just don't like people say oh well, well there's so many of them but like so far at least speaking as you know the degrees in astronomy uh, life's kind of rare you know it's it's plentiful here 
but the big picture sense, you know, there, you know, there, we don't know that life is everywhere and everything. And so just walking around, treating it kind of callously and, and engaging in a lot of killing is just not something that, um, I think is like a responsible outlook on, on the importance of life. Cause so far we're kind of it. Um, maybe when we find out that there's, you know, 5 billion planets with life all across the universe, and it's pretty commonplace maybe we can then say okay well we can waste some if you will but for the most part i try to be respectful well i'm i agree with you i have uh, two things on that one is a, uh just any type of traveling i've done for business i've always see where there's so many places where and then you just even for, in work in in in, 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 a, in a office environment, and you go out for lunch or food every day, and you see all the food that's prepared and how much of it is wasted, how many animals died that and they just got they get killed for nothing, and they know it doesn't even go to feed somebody, just it gets thrown out, and I think that's 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 a real sin. And then the other thing is um, when I used to go to Fordham University. Uh, I would go to the Bronx Zoo several times a week because it was free Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And I absolutely loved the Bronx Zoo. Mm -hmm. I've rented the Bronx Zoo over 200 times. And I haven't been there in a long time. And uh, I, I became friends with an elephant. She was a really sweet girl. She was very friendly, and she knew me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they know you. Boy, they don't forget you, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, I don't know if you've ever uh, uh, pet an elephant's trunk, their, their hair is like wire. Yep. And they are there. They have forty thousand muscles in their trunk. Mm. And uh, I would open up a bag of potato chips, and I wasn't particularly interested in eating that many potato chips. But the elephant, was, she would come over, mm. and she could take the tip of her snout and flip open, widen the uh, the bag mm. of potato chips, and suction them up and put them in. And she she knew it. She knew that mm. I would come over, I'd go to the same spot, and you know, and she she let me pet her, and we became friends. Fast forward seven years, not being there, come back on a date with a girl mm -hmm. and um, walk over to the elephant. The elephant walks right over to me. The other people are there. She walks right over to me. She comes right over to me. I give her the potatoes. Mm -hmm. She does a thing. She's looking at me like, this is my friend. Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, I, I, how, how could you, you have to have a different attitude if mm -hmm. in that moment on. You know? Yeah, my grandmother um, was hugely into elephants. Um, I'm not really sure why, but, um, it it just became a thing where like she collects elephant figurines or she collected elephant figurines and so that sort of became like the thing to give her yeah okay so naturally you know everybody bombing her with with elephant figurines she's gonna get elephant stuff everywhere so you know um, and I think I think she went went once on a trip to Indonesia where like I there's pictures of me like riding elephants stuff like that as a you? little kid yeah. really wow and she's out there too and she got to see them and everything like that and it's really it's really interesting and I actually recently turned down a trip to go hang out in uh, South Africa because it was basically being run by a place that does like the big game hunting type things no, 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 no. so I was like eh, can't I really can't that. support you guys no. and show up around there I feel bad about that and her memory grandmother's long past. But it was like just definitely something that I couldn't really get into. No, so. no, I, don't, I can't support that either. Yeah, and I, and I think this the, the cruelty of it, how you consider this sport hunting this animal is defenseless compared to you. You're sitting there some 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 distance away, right? And you take a bullet and you kill it. What does that have to do? How, how what is that doing for anything? Especially now since the, so many are on the verge of extinction, you're not thinning out the herd to yeah. save them. Yeah. You're 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 only making enough of letting enough of them live so you can kill one when when they get old. Why would you? I plus I don't, I don't understand what is, what is the appeal of this? I mean, you know, we Never walked past it. the Teddy Roosevelt era where you did, like aren't we enlightened? You know, that's that's not something I I, I really want to, yeah. to, to experience with anyone. Okay, so I don't know. Do you think we're at nineteen or twenty? Uh, I don't know. We could do a couple more just okay, to get two more. Ones. I'm sure some of these answers are pretty boring. Um, no, they're not at all. The, the 53 is interesting because I really want to try to rewrite it. Um, ideally, would you rather be an authority figure or someone with a great sense of humor? And what does that mean to you? I was looking for a different option to throw in there, too. And okay. I, I wrestled around with that one. Because um, I feel we're sort of in the Machiavelli, you know, would you rather be loved or feared? You know, everyone loves the humor guy or fears the authority figure. But I was looking for something 
like a different route in there because I don't have like the real need desire to be like an authority figure. But, and I think I've tried to move towards the great sense of humor part. I don't know. I think you've seen me like, on Facebook and stuff like that. Like that's generally how I try to come across like a lot of humor and everything aside from my weird political rantings and, and, and whatnot. But you're, you're I, a provocateur. I'll say that. Instigator. Instigator. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Aunt Gwen. Uh, she both called me that and taught me that word Instigator? when I was a little kid. Yeah. Uh, but I think between those two, staying within the within the within the goals or the parameters, if you will, a uh, great sense of humor. That would be, I think, something more I would go for. I think if you can convince, or not convince, but if you can make people believe that you know you have a great sense of humor um and it's going to give you a lot of even credibility not if you are the fool but if you use like an uh, intelligent sense of humor i think that would be better um to me for me suit me better than to be seen as like the authoritarian i think that's how you come across a lot of people (laughs) that's what i'm going for so Mm -hmm. you know it's it's you know I'll take a good sense of humor right now. We'll see if it's great. I don't know. Okay. Um, so the day, last question. The last that, one. Uh, I think, what is it? Uh, what should everyone know about you? And I think that, like, I can't think of a you know, factoid or something that someone necessarily would know, but in general, that... Like I'm trying, you know. There's that. There's that. That concept of if you're good, it's not really laudable to do good or or to be good or or, or perform good actions and everything like that. That's 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 easy. It's easy for angels to be good, if you will. Okay. But. If you're a regular person, someone who can do bad, and I, I'm not, you know, there's there's no hookers buried in a desert under my name or anything like that. But I've done things that I'm not that proud of, I've let people down, foibles. and all that kind of okay. stuff. And so, for me to attempt to do better, I think makes me feel like I'm actually doing something positive. You know what I mean? It's 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 yes. a it's not that you know I can claim to be like this really great person. It's just I'm trying to be a better person as I continue through this one way trip of time, um, and I'm hoping that I'm doing that. You know, net net. You know, leaving less of a wake of problems, of bad feelings, and so forth. I mean, you know, there, there's things I don't necessarily bend on. You know, I can certainly be stubborn in certain areas, stuff like that. But even then, I'm trying. I'm not really trying to be. You know, you said provocateur, and I said instigator, and all that kind of stuff. But I don't. I don't think I'm trying to hurt, damage people, um, or give bad feelings or bad vibrations, stuff like that. You know, I think. It's, 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 I don't want to necessarily be the pushover either, but I don't feel like to obstinately force, um, views or insights on other people while at the same time I'm trying to, I guess, put out like a good, I don't know, air, aura, vibration, atmosphere, so forth, such that, you know, it, it kind of resonates in a lot of ways, you know, you can, you can diffuse a lot of situations um, that could otherwise be like really, I don't know, noisy or fighty or whatever. If you just sort of try to try try to like look at the end goal of, of the world that you want to have as a result of whatever is coming out and sort of steer things towards that. Well, anyway, I think that's we've covered twenty. There we go. If you think... need any more, I can phone some in. You know, <laughs> okay. Come up with some other ones. Write my own. And now, as I say with everybody else, because I know this is what all the kids say, we'll see you next time. Peace out.